Yeah, thank you. I'll talk in English, but uh, I can answer questions in Russian as well. So, uh, I'd like to thank the organizers for this event and uh, for inviting me. And I also want to thank the organizers for actually helping build this uh, great community. It's it's really amazing. Uh, I'm Rand from Yerevanen. Uh, where is this? Okay. So Yerevanen is a small research lab based in Armenia. Uh, currently we are involved in three main projects. I'll quickly introduce them. So the first one is about uh, clinical time series analysis. Uh, so the clinical time series, it's uh, electronic health records from hospitals and there are many problems on those <coughs> data sets. And unfortunately the community there is not as good as we see in computer vision or in ad other areas. So there are lots of problems with reproducibility. There are very few free data sets. There are uh, very few public uh, code bases on GitHub. So uh, one thing that we're doing there is to build a benchmark on existing data sets and uh, building some baselines uh, based on LSTMs. Uh, we already have a paper, the final version of it will appear in uh, a few weeks and the code is ready and uh, many people already started to use our uh, benchmarks. Uh, the other project or a set of projects is related to building NLP tools for Armenian. Armenian is a pretty low resource language. Uh, so. For example, if you take word to vec and train on Armenian Wikipedia, it doesn't produce all those good analogies. It produces only some of them, so there is not enough data. And uh, we started to collaborate with linguists at Yerevan State University, and the first success is that we uh, have built a small tree bank for Armenian, which is already released, like just two weeks ago. It was released as part of Universal Dependencies version 2.2, and uh, hopefully in a few months we'll have first open source parsers and part of speech targets for our beacon. And the third project that I'll talk about today is uh, relation extraction from biomedical texts. It's a collaboration with Information Sciences Institute at University of Southern California. But before starting, uh, I'll try to do some introductory uh, overview of what's happening in NLP as we see it. So my talk will be less technical than the ones before, I guess, so uh, sorry if you get bored. Uh, I'll start from this slide from uh, Jan Lekun's presentation. I think he uses this presentation in many of his, uh, this slide in many of his presentations. It says that uh, if in traditional machine learning you get like, you take a manual feature extractor and uh, the trainable part comes only after that. Uh, in deep learning, you don't need feature extractors. You just feed the data in its raw form to the system and the network will learn whatever it needs. It will learn feature extractors. It will learn everything that is needed to get a high score. So uh, when you get to deep learning first and see these slides, you get an impression that uh, this is the way to go with deep learning. Uh, but it quickly turns out that when you don't have a large data set, uh, this doesn't really work. So the networks cannot learn to extract features if you don't have enough data. And you get into another misconception that maybe you, don't, uh, you can't use deep learning when you don't have large data sets. So uh, in this talk, I'll try to make a point that uh, deep learning works both on raw features and manual extracted features and features extracted from other systems. So, uh, and uh, everything depends on the size of the data set that you are working on. Uh, so, uh, if you uh, came to NLP field after studying deep learning, just like me, uh, probably the first thing you uh, have seen in NLP will be this blog post uh, by Andrei Karpati, uh, which is called Unreasonable Effectiveness of RNNs. And as the previous speaker says, every time we say RNN, we mean LSTM. Uh, it is based on uh, their paper at Stanford, uh, and it shows that uh, LSTM networks can learn to model the language. 
uh, modeling language is uh, when you get the sequence of uh, characters in this case, and at each step you want to predict the next character. Okay, so uh, this blog post and this paper shows that without any kind of feature extractors, uh, LSTMs can learn this task uh, very well. And uh, so uh, you obtain a generative model that can generate some English text, which has correct syntax more or less, but uh, does not have any meaning, or it can even generate uh, LaTeX papers or even C++ code that doesn't have a, a syntax error. And in this case, even tokenization is not needed because everything is happening at character levels. But uh, we have to notice that in case of language modeling, you have potentially unlimited data, right? You can take like entire Wikipedia and train your model. You can take entire web and train your model so you don't have a shortage of data. And that's part of the reason that uh, LSTMs work well on, uh, without any features. Uh, a similar problem is uh, word vector learning. Uh, when you take, again, potentially unlimited data and you try to learn uh, vectors for every word, uh, in this case, actually, you need tokenizers. Uh, for example, uh, Facebook released uh, pre-trained word vectors for more than 200 languages last year. And the first edition of them uh, were actually very bad for low resource languages, including Armenian, because the tokenization was not done properly. So uh, tokenization is something that you need to take into account in word vectors in contrast to character level language modeling. But still you get very good results without other feature extractors. Uh, when you have this, when you have these word vectors, when you have systems that can learn language modeling, then you can use them to bootstrap your uh, models or systems that work with less data. Okay, so uh, we have all seen that almost every NLP system now uses some sort of word vectors. Uh, let's quickly talk about machine translation. So if you take the latest major development in the sphere of machine translation, it's the transformer architecture. It doesn't use pre-trained word vectors. So it has word embeddings, but the embeddings are learned during the process uh, together with the full system. So they don't use any word vectors. And uh, one of the reasons is that the paper uh, Google published actually uh, evaluates this system on WMT English German dataset, which has more than 4 million annotated pairs of sentences. Okay, so that's a pretty huge data set. And in fact, Google and other players in this field have much larger internal data sets. So it's not a surprise that these systems work without any feature extractors, without even word vectors pre-trained. And uh, actually, uh, two months ago, there was a, a hackathon on a low resource machine translation organized by FISTEC. Uh, and during this DPAC, uh, we have noticed that when you don't have enough data, uh, then these systems uh, do not work well. Like, uh, uh, traditional translation systems can easily beat these neural architectures when there is not enough data. And uh, by the way, if you're interested in machine translation and didn't attend the DPAC bubble, I uh, highly recommend to watch this talk by Roman Paulus uh, during the hackathon. He's from Salesforce. Uh, so, uh, in this diagram, uh, I'll put machine translation again at the bottom. So, you have, when you have very large data sets, you still get uh, good results with uh, deep learning without any feature extractors. Uh, the next problem that I'd like to focus is part of speech tagging and dependency parsing. It's essentially the syntactic parsing of the sentence. Uh, the main data set since early 90s is the pen tree bank for English, and it has like 40, more than 40,000 annotated sentences. Recently, universal dependencies standard are becoming basically the new standard, and uh, now there are uh, uh, 50, uh, there are a large, more or less large tree banks for 57 languages. Uh, and still, if you look at the winner models for these data sets, uh, they are some versions of RNNs, and they still do not use any additional features. 
So uh, at the bottom of the screen, you see some example of a dependency tree. Probably you know this. Uh, so I'll put them here. So uh, for example, in Pantry Bank, you have like roughly 700,000 words annotated, and it's still fine not to use any feature extractor. The next example is natural language inference. Misha Bursav talked about this before today. So the problem is the following. You have two sentences at its input and one of the three labels. So uh, either the two sentences contain a contradiction or the first one, uh, the, the second one follows from the first one or these two sentences are neutral. And uh, a team at Stanford has released a very large data set of uh, annotated pairs, like more than 500,000. It was in 2015, and last year there was an explosion of papers. So uh, this image shows is a screenshot from their leaderboard. Uh, like uh, there were papers coming out every week, and uh, every week you were getting new state-of-the-art numbers. Uh, and uh, right now the best model has 89% uh, accuracy. It's an ensemble. Uh, you can see that the competition is tough, although I want to say that this doesn't mean that natural language inference problem is solved by no means. Like this data set has its own problems and if you even get 100% there, it doesn't mean anything serious. Uh, and one of these models that w w was in this leaderboard uh, was uh, from Facebook. It's called, it's, uh, it's describing an architecture which is called densely interactive inference networks. It was properly described in a paper. It, the paper is accepted at ICLR this year. And uh, we at Yerevan tried to uh, reproduce this work. Uh, we have a code in uh, Keras framework. Uh, this uh, system was the state of the art of, uh, for a few days at least. So it was like 88%. Uh, F-score and this system is interesting that it uses word vectors and part of speech tags. So they pre-process the text, they get the part of speech tags, they also get word vectors from Glove actually, uh, they also use some character level embeddings and uh, these uh, features are fed into a network like this. Uh, you can see that uh, it, in fact it's a pretty complex system uh, you have first sentence and the second sentence and you have a, a similar encoder systems here which contain like self-attention mechanisms and stuff. It's pretty complex like shortcut connections and so on. And then uh, these uh, two representations of both sentences are merged together into a large tensor and then a convolutional network is applied on top of this uh, merged representation and finally you get one of the three classes. Uh, so still uh, like a pretty deep network but uh, the authors did ablation studies and showed that part of speech tags and word vectors are critical for this network to achieve uh, good results. So uh, if you look at uh, this diagram, so I'm putting natural language inference here and I'm showing with arrows that whatever you learned in word vectors and uh, in part of speech tags on larger data sets can help uh, in tasks with not so large data sets. And a very similar thing is happening with uh, question answering actually. Uh, like there is a famous data set by Stanford and again there is a lot of competition on that and most of the systems use word vectors and some of them use part of speech tags as well. So finally uh, we get to relation extraction tasks. So uh, here is an example of a relation extraction task. It was actually uh, part of a contest semival 2017. So you have a, a paragraph like this and some of the words here are entities, in this case they are tasks or processes and some of these entities have some relations. In this case it was pretty simple, so you are looking for synonyms or abbreviations or something like this, so if you take this ent uh, entity, which is named entity recognition and NER, you should say that they are the same entities. And there is another type which is like this is a type of this, right? So uh, 
uh, not the data set size. So it had only uh, 5,000 annotated entities in the data set. So in this case, there is no hope that an end-to-end -end system will learn uh, all the feature extractors. So if you look at the uh, winner model, it was published by uh, Allens Institute for Artificial Intelligence. Uh, I think they have one of the best NLP teams in the world now. So their system is using all kinds of feature extractors available. So you can see that this first part is an entity recognizer, uh, which is just an LSTM that goes through each word and tries to predict whether it's an entity or not. And it also makes use of a language model on a larger data set. So the language model here helps entity recognizer to work better. And after you're done with entity recognition, you take pairs of entities and uh, pass it to this other network, which uh, accepts lots of features. So uh, it takes word vectors, it takes part of speech tags. Uh, the authors actually use Spacey library, which is a pretty good library. Actually, it's very easy to use and much easier and faster than uh, Stanford, Stanford's parsers. Uh, they use dependency graphs, so they parse the sentence using some dependency parser, and they also use paths extracted from the graph. So you, you take two entities in the graph and take the shortest path, like, or it's a tree, so it's the only path between the entities, and that's also part of your input here. Uh, and they also use some concept called gazetteers. It's something like uh, knowledge from some databases like Wikipedia or other knowledge bases. So all of these feature extractors that uh, are used in traditional machine learning systems are fed into a neural network. Uh, so uh, if you look at this diagram, I put this at the top, so you have a lot less data, annotated data, but uh, many things below uh, are actually helping to build a better system for this task. So finally we get to the our problem. Our problem is protein-protein uh, interaction extraction. So uh, the input to the system is a sentence. It's a sentence from biomedical literature. So there are lots of papers published in biomedical journals and uh, no one can read them all, but uh, these papers contain important information for biologists and for pharma industry. So everyone wants to have an automatic tool that will read these papers and extract some information. In this particular case, we are talking about relations between proteins or other biological entities. So here is an ex example like SP1 and SP3 bind to the AR1 sequence. So SP1 is one entity, SP3 another, AR1 sequence is an entity with two words, which is uh, obviously becoming a problem. Uh, and you have binding interaction between these two, these two, but do not have interaction between these two. So this is what you need to predict from the uh, row sentence. Uh, so one problem with this task is that uh, there are no good data sets. So there are data sets uh, that you uh, take one of them, train your model on, on it, and then you uh, test your model on another data set and you get like very bad numbers. So if you, uh, this is a actually general problem in the field. Like if you take a long sentence, like five lines, and you give it to uh, five biologists and ask them to annotate, they will give you five different answers. So the problem is actually much deeper. And uh, when we saw this, we decided that uh, we need a properly annotated data set, like with a fixed set of guidelines, rules for annotation. And luckily we uh, started to collaborate with the team from Institute of Molecular Biology in Armenia. So they are annotating uh, a data set with uh, 2,000 sentences. They have already annotated like more than 7,000 entities in it and extracted almost 3,000 binding interactions from these sentences. Uh, and uh, in this diagram, I will put this at the very top, and uh, obviously this is what we are going to do now, to uh, try to solve this problem by using everything below. 
so what we did, uh, we have created a pipeline which is uh, working as follows. Okay, uh, so it takes a sentence, uh, it runs some entity uh, recognizer and extracts entities, then it uh, creates the pairs for uh, candidate uh, interactions, and then there is a final uh, classification layer that assigns binary labels to these uh, candidates. Uh, this pipeline is still work in progress, uh, but it's already available on GitHub. We are working on it. So uh, it's written in a way that it's easy to uh, replace the modules, add modules, whatever. Uh, it has a, it, it supports many uh, types of feature extractors, uh, like part of speech tags, dependency graphs, AMR graphs. I will talk about this in a minute. And uh, the most important part here is the relation classifier, uh, which is something that we are building uh, using some neural networks. Again, it is work in progress. It is available on GitHub. And the general architecture is the following. So you have the full sentence at, it, at the input, and you have some representation of the candidate interaction as, the, as your input. So. Then uh, you add some neural network that will uh, produce a binary label. It will say whether this sentence contains this interaction or not. Uh, like the easiest baseline is you take like uh, bidirectional GRUs on both sides and then concatenate the results and uh, add a couple of dense layers. Uh, but you can see that this formulation of the problem is uh, fitting the other problems that I described, which is natural language inference or question answering. So again, you have like two inputs, two sequences, and you can apply anything that uh, worked well for the other tasks. So in this case, we took uh, this DIIN networks that I described a few minutes ago and applied it on, uh, on our data. Also, uh, instead of candidate interaction, uh, we can use like uh, parts from the dependency graphs, just like uh, I showed you uh, the paper by Alan Institute. So again, you take the two entities, you take a path in the tree, and this path, uh, along with the edges, becomes uh, your like a second sentence, uh, if you like. Uh, our experiments show that uh, simply adding dependency graphs can lead uh, in huge improvements. So uh, these are preliminary results. We didn't do a uh, serious hyperparameter search, so these numbers will change a lot, but uh, this clearly shows that when you have limited amount of data, a simple thing like uh, Stanford dependency graph uh, will help you a lot. Although uh, it still adds its own noise because sometimes you get uh, you get a tree from Spacey or from some parser, and you can't find your entities there because, for example, your entities had multiple words and they appear in different parts of the tree. Uh, so you get some noise like five percent or ten percent, but still, uh, taking into account this noise, your general performance gets better. And in our experiments, we saw that uh, bringing just the architecture from natural language inference to this problem. Uh, again, helped a lot, although uh, we still couldn't get benefits from both. So when we combine them, we don't get better than each of them. Uh, and maybe a few words about future work. So uh, obviously we're going to try more feature extractors. We don't hope to get a lot more data, like 10 times more data. So we're going to squeeze more from this data. Uh, one feature extractor that I'd like to focus on is uh, called AMR graphs. So uh, this is uh, like a less popular but pretty interesting concept. So uh, it's a way to represent a sentence uh, by a graph which captures the semantic content of the uh, sentence uh, in contrast to the syntactic content, right? So for example, these three sentences here, the cat wants to eat the fish the cat's desire is to eat fish, or eating fish is what the cat desires. These three sentences have completely different uh, uh, syntactic structures, so their uh, dependency graphs will be very different. But uh, if you parse AMR graph correctly, all of these uh, sentences will correspond to the same AMR graph. 
So I think that this is a pretty uh, promising direction, although uh, AMR parsing is very far from dependency parsing. The quality is very low. Uh, on the other hand, there are new data sets for uh, AMRs, like the most recent one has 60,000 entities, uh, 60,000 sentences uh, with their corresponding AMR graphs. Uh, so there is a lot of room for improvement there. On the other hand, it's a, it's a very hard task. So you can imagine that if you do this correctly, then relation extraction like is solved essentially because this uh, structure captures almost everything you need there. And uh, it's hard to believe that uh, this will be solved in the upcoming years. But there is a lot of potential there. So another idea is to bring pre-trained model from larger data sets. Uh, for example, uh, there is a recent paper by Salesforce that uh, takes a machine translation system, a simple encoder-decoder system. Okay, I say it's simple, but it's not. So they take the, I think, the uh, Google NMT system. And uh, then they take the uh, last layer of the encoder, where you have uh, representations for each word, and uh, then try to use these uh, vectors as word vectors for other problems. And they show that they can improve performance on natural language inference and question answering problems there. So uh, it's obvious that we will have more arrows uh, in this diagram uh, in upcoming months. Today uh, in the morning, uh, Misha Burtz have uh, told about uh, InferSent paper from Facebook, which uh, uses uh, essentially the uh, pre-trained models for natural language inference to help uh, sentence classification tasks with less data. Uh, and finally, one more idea is uh, to use uh, the technique called uh, distance supervision. Uh, whenever you don't have any hope of getting more data, you can try to build like artificial large data sets with lots of noise in the labels. Uh, the idea is that uh, you can take one, uh, say, uh, knowledge base where you have uh, like ground truth information about interactions between proteins and then look at papers and look for sentences where both entities appear in the sentences and then assign positive label to that sentence. So you just uh, decide that if a sentence contains both entities then it probably uh, says that these two entities are binding which is not true in general, but uh, okay, that, that's a noise. And there is some evidence that it works in biomedical domain, and uh, one thing that we are working on right now is to actually validate this technique given uh, we ha already have uh, some data set. Uh, I think that's it. Thank you for attention. How did you decide that hmm? Uh, not enough data was the reason why model does not work. Yeah, so uh, you, the, the main uh, thing that you see is that when your model has enough parameters, it's overfitting quickly. And if you're decreasing your parameters, you don't learn anything. And you know that for similar tasks, when you have like more data, like natural language inference, the same system worked. So it's not that I have a proof that the system doesn't work and that's the reason, but that's the general intuition. So uh, if you have an architecture that works on a similar data and uh, you can't find uh, the number of parameters that balances between overfitting and learning, you decide, you, you try uh, other stuff like more features, more extractors. That's the general idea. Thank you.